Look at all you beautiful people. You know, when they told me that I would be starting at 9 a.m., I looked at the schedule. I said, 9 a.m., that's, that's quite early. And then I saw that the welcome speech was at noon. I said, what kind of people are going to be there at 9 a.m. when the welcome doesn't tell noon? And then I thought, my kind of people. My kind of people. Because I, when I was going to, to conferences, when I'd go to CPAC, man, I was the first one there. I was, I was at every conference. I was wanting to go to all the things. And I, I said, they'll be my kind of weirdos in that room this morning at 9 a.m. So it is beautiful to see you all here. But more than, more than you being here, I've got to wonder why you're here. I mean, that is, that is important. Why did you get up so early, get yourself all dressed up? Some of you made your faces up, some of you didn't. I'm not going to point you out. <laughs> but why? Why did you get up to come to this conference at 9 a.m. and be here? We'll get to you. We'll get to you. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. Listen to this. I was teaching a class in Carmel, Indiana. And I was standing in front of the class, and they were looking at me, and I was looking at them, and it was quiet. What if government didn't do that, I asked. And if you're like those folks in the room, you're thinking, what if government didn't do what? And so somebody in the back said, what if they didn't do what? And I said, name it, let's talk about it. What if government didn't do that? And some brave soul said, education. I said, good, good one. What if government didn't do education? What if tomorrow the governor of Indiana came out and said, effective immediately, not one more red cent will come from taxpayer dollars to go towards education. Effective immediately, we are closing all the public schools. We are dismissing all the teachers and all the administrators. No longer will government be in the education business. If that happened, what would parents do? Would parents just go, huh, well, I guess my kid's going to be stupid. Of course they wouldn't. Of course they wouldn't. Parents would do things. Government is not the only institution in this civil society. We have institutions like business. We have institutions like communities, and communities involve churches. Communities involve mutual aid societies. A lot of people would take action to start educating children if government didn't do that. Well, there was a lady in the back of the room who could not accept the idea that if government didn't do it, that it'd get done. And I talked with this woman for quite some time. He, her and I had a conversation probably longer than it should have gone, but I was having way too much fun to stop. And I wanted everybody in the room to hear this conversation. And so I kept going and kept going and kept going. Until I finally had to stop it. And we went on with the training and afterwards. And after the training, as, as any trainer, any speaker knows, generally after the trainer, there's some folks who will come to the front of the room and want to talk to you. And you'll have this discussion for maybe, you know, sometimes 20, sometimes 30 minutes. And after the training, I was talking to one of the other people in the room. And I could see out of the corner of my eye where this woman was sitting. And I saw her stand abruptly and start marching towards the front of the room. And I thought, giddy up, here we go. And I turned and she looked at me and she was just so, you're the most libertarian person I've ever met in my life. You're like 100% libertarian and you're making me think. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, sweetheart, you say the sweetest things. <laughs> I told this story not long ago, and I tell it to you today for a couple of reasons. One, to emphasize the power of storytelling. We, uh, we were all talking in here a little bit ago. Everyone was talking with one another. I started introducing myself, called you all a bunch of weirdos, and then I started telling a story, and the place just kind of got quiet, and everybody started paying attention. And it, it started with something key I did at the very beginning Anybody remember the first two sentences I said when I, before I started my story? I said, I'm going to tell you a story. Listen to this. 
that clicks in your brain. Check this out. Check what out? Listen to this. And then I started a story and you were all locked in. Stories are powerful. Stories are really powerful. But I tell this story because I want people to understand that there is a mental model that is pervasive from the left to the right. And the only people I haven't seen with this mental, mark, uh, mental model are my anarchist friends. And this mental model is, if government doesn't do it, it won't be done. And I explain that there are other institutions, and I really want to emphasize that. And I emphasize that through stories. And I emphasize that through asking questions. Because I could stand up here and say, well, let's think about this. How many churches are there? Now, if you divide the number of churches by the number of students, we have an average number of students in each church. And you would go to sleep very quickly. If I started spilling facts and data out of my mouth, you'd tune out. But when I tell a story, it changes. When I tell a story, it changes. Now, let me introduce myself. My name is Dwayne Lester. I am the Director of Edu Issue Education for the Grassroots Leadership Academy. One of the things I do is talk about all the different issues that Americans for Prosperity, Americans for Prosperity Foundation is in, but I also do a lot of training, and I love talking about stories. What I'd like you to do now since you all seem to know each other, and you were all talking before, which is great, I want you to take, let's say, there used to be a clock up there. I'm going to have to use my watch now. Let's take five minutes at your tables, and I want you to talk with the people at your table about why storytelling is so powerful. What is it about storytelling that works? It's 9.07 now. At 9.12, I'll bring you all back, and we'll discuss what you said.
Five minutes does go fast, doesn't it, folks? Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. I'm going to get off of that. I can't see you beautiful people out here. Come on down. I'm coming out. I'm coming out to the folks. Now, what I want to know, I'm going to go around and I want to know what you all talked about, what you identified as why stories are important. I'm going to start at this table. Somebody at random, Ashley. Oh, totally random. Ashley, the State Director for Americans for Prosperity in Pennsylvania, right here. What is it? Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. What is it that your table identified as why stories are important? Because it, to some degree for everyone, they can find a way to relate. To some degree for everyone, they can find a way to relate. Excellent. Excellent. How about this table? Let's hear it. Well, I wanted to hear your story about or learn how to share stories and engage people who have a different opinion because we are all comfortable preaching to the choir, mm -hmm. but we have to reach beyond our circle of friends if we want to change the hearts and minds of people and win them over. That's a great point. That's a great point. I asked this question when I was teaching in, in Alaska. I was in Wasilla, Alaska. It was a great time, I'm telling you folks. You Sarah, right? It was Sarah Palin and me. I was training her. Not true. I made that up. <laughs> but I was, I was training in Wasilla, and I said, why do we tell stories? And this gentleman in the back said, because people buy with emotion and they justify with logic. And I said, say that again, friend. And he said, because people buy with emotion and they justify with logic. And I said, I'm stealing that. And he said, you could have it. I stole it from someone else. But it goes to that. If you want to win hearts and minds... People buy with emotion, they justify with logic. You start spitting a bunch of facts and figures and, and logic at people, you can turn them off right away. But you start telling a story, you can win with emotion and then justify with logic. What did you talk about? The fact that when you tell a story, and especially if it's your story, that's your testimony. Mm -hmm. And so even if someone doesn't believe what you're saying, they can't say what you're saying isn't true. That's your testimony and... They can't say what you're saying isn't true. That's right. That's right. Anybody else have anything important that they wanted to point out right over here? I'm going to lean in close, not because I want to hug, but I'm sharing my mic with you. That's fine. But I'll take a hug later. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. One of the greatest things is that our dear Lord told parables. Mm -hmm. And parables are stories. And he was the greatest person on earth, and he knew how to do it right. Yep. Yep, Jesus told stories, didn't he? Yes. Jesus told stories, yeah. I want you to think about this also. How many people in here are parents? Raise your hand if you have kids. So I'm seeing the number of people who've ever seen the movie Up by Pixar. I've seen it about a kabillion times. And there's a dog in there named Doug. And Doug will be in the middle of a conversation. And squirrel! And then he'll go right back to the conversation he was having, but he's constantly distracted by things. Squirrel! Going on around him. We're the same way. We get distracted about 2,000 times a day. We're constantly being pulled in different directions all the time. But what happened this morning when I started talking about what I did in Carmel, Indiana? Whew. Stories bring focus. You start telling a story, a person wants to hear the whole story. They will listen to what you're saying. And one of the most interesting things about stories is something called neural coupling. If I'm telling you a story, Jimmy, if I sit down here and I start telling you a story, what you'll find is, and what they've done in studies, is that if I start describing when I was walking on the beach and I start talking about how the sand felt between my toes and how it was chilly that morning, and I could feel the, the mist from the waves crashing and hitting my, my face, and I could hear the waves, and I could hear the birds, and I could smell. Everything that's going on in my brain starts firing off in your brain. And so we're actually connecting on like a brainwave level. And it's, it's scary, but you can almost implant thoughts in someone's head using these stories. It is such a powerful, powerful tool. Now, every once in a while, I'm going to be talking to Nate in the back. He's a friend of mine. He's controlling my slides. I've known Nate, uh, we go way back to about 30 minutes ago. And 
I'm going to have him put a video on here in a second. This is an interview we did with Arthur Brooks. Arthur Brooks, great economist, used to be the president of the American Enterprise Institute. And he's going to describe to us the power of stories. He goes into a, a little bit more detail. But what I want you to think about is he describes how one can be greater than 10 million. How one can be greater than 10 million. And I want you to ask yourself, do facts back up the story or does the story back up the facts? So Nate, if you don't mind, it's on slide number five. Let's go ahead and play that video. So speaking of growing the movement, I think it's easy to talk to folks that already agree with us, right? But when we start getting outside of that bubble and start trying to engage with folks that are ideologically opposed to us, it's easy for us to want to fall into the trap of using facts, figures, stats, data, the data-driven arguments, right? Is that the most effective way to change hearts and minds? And if not, what is? It really is a, is a temptation. You know, and I'm a guy who suffered through a PhD in quantitative policy analysis. So you can imagine, you know, the first thing that I want to talk about is you know, the minimum wage, it's a nightmare. It, it eliminates jobs and a much better way to, to cr make work pay is to expand the earned income tax credit for single men who have you know, non-custodial care of their kids. You know, it's like wonk, 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 and, and you know, nobody's following, right? Why not? Because when well, there's a lot of neurological data about why not, I mean, the, the, basic, the basic fact is that when you're not talking about people, when you're not telling a story with a, with about a, a real person with a real face and a real life, you're not going to get people's brains to engage with you. You're not going to stimulate the production of the, of the neurochemicals that bond people to each other. Specifically, there's a lot of research out there that talks about the production of oxytocin, which is a hormone in which people bond to each other. You only bond to a stranger when that stranger is telling you a story. And so, so here's the deal. You know, a lot of people who are watching us, and, 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 and people like me and you, we're, we're kind of wonky. You know, we're sort of into the data. I got that, but you got to throw off your chains. You got to remember that that's not how most people are wired and that's not how you're going to reach most people. Start with a story, a real story of a real person. And I know it sometimes even feels a little cheesy, but you ha we have to get over this resistance to it. There's, a, there's an old saying that one is greater than 10 million. If I tell you that, you know, Jeb, there are 10 million kids in Sub-Saharan Africa that today have, in a, in, that have a lack of access to safe, um, safe drinking water, um, and they might die. You say, wow, oh, 10 million, that's a lot. And now if I tell you about Joey in Tanzania, who's six and doesn't have access to safe, reliable drinking water, and might not actually make it into elementary school, might die, because several of his friends have. And here's his picture, and, and, and here's what he wants to do when he grows up. You're engaged in that, because that's how we're wired. We're wired to love each other. We're wired to bond to each other. Facts and figures don't bond us to each other. They, they back up the truth of what our stories are telling us. Every single person watching us needs to become a better storyteller if we want to get our point across. One is greater than 10 million. It's a, it's a powerful idea. It's a powerful idea, and it's one that I use in my trainings, and let me tell you how. I am one of the lead trainers to go out and discuss free trade. I am the most libertarian person you've ever met, remember? So when I go out and talk about free trade, it's usually two groups that might not be as open to the idea as I am. And sometimes there's conflict, and sometimes there's opposition. And so one of the things I do is I have the groups identify all the problems that they have with free trade. And one of the most common problems, or one of the most common arguments, is that tariffs are a bargaining chip. They're a, a short-term pain for a long-term gain. And I could go through and I could show all the ways that this is wrong statistically. You know, I could use the statistics. I could use the data. But what I do is I prefer to go and use one is greater than 10 million. And I was in, I was in South Dakota, a room of 80 people, and this came up. And I, I put up a picture of my family. I have eight kids. One on the way. Stop right now. No, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> no, I'm not Mormon. And yes, I know what causes that. Those are the three questions I get. 
So I put up a picture of my family, and I went through each one of my kids. Every, every Father's Day, we take a picture, me and all the kids. And I went through and I introduced each kid, one by one. I won't put you through this. And I took time describing their personalities. I take time describing what they care about, who they are, what kind of person they are. And then I get to the end, and I said, now, the wife and I have a, a proposition that if we act on this, it could really, really benefit a few of us. I mean, it could be a game changer for a few of us. But it's going to cause one of them a lot of pain. So which one of my kids is the bargaining chip? Which one of my children should I subject to short-term pain so that the rest of us can have that long-term gain? Which one of my children should I sacrifice to the collective? Because that's what we're talking about here. We are taking a collectivist view and we're denying the individuals. One, at that point, becomes greater than the whole. I do the same thing with a story out of Southwest Missouri where there's a nail factory. And I could talk about how steel tariffs are hurting this. But instead, I focus on the story that I read in the newspaper about a man who works at this factory who voted for President Trump, who is now being hurt by tariffs. But not so much about him, but about the fact that his five-year-old daughter has a genetic heart defect, and he gets his health care through this factory that is now on its, on its last legs. And if he loses his job, his daughter loses her health care at the level she has it now. So should this five-year-old girl, should she feel that short-term pain so that everybody else can have this long-term gain? One is greater than 10 million. That's what stories can help you do. They, you, you narrow it down to that individual. You tell that story to that person. And you can have an impact. Don't talk about the whole country. In Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, he points out that if there were a tragedy in China and 100 million people died, you'd say, oh, that's awful. That, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. That's, that's horrific. And then an hour or two later, you'd be going on with your day, and you wouldn't be thinking anything about it. But if I came to you and said, oh, by the way, uh, that little dot on your fing pinky finger, uh, that's cancer. We have to take your whole finger off. That would weigh on you until you finally fell asleep that night. Your little pinky finger would have a bigger impact on you than 10, 100 million dead people in a foreign country. One pinky finger greater than 100 million. Make it about the individual. Now, we talked earlier about your why. Why are you here? And I want to go to the next, the next video, Nate. Um, this is a man named Simon, Simon Sinek. Simon is a, he teaches leadership. And in this, next, in this next clip, he's explaining something he calls the golden circle about how the greatest companies, the most innovative companies, how they talk about what they do. And they don't talk about what they do. I'll let Simon explain what it is that they do. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. 
I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales are done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. That is the key from that entire video. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So someone asks you what went on Friday, you could say, oh, I went to the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. You could say that, or you could say, why? Why did you come here? Certainly not to see some farm boy from Missouri call you a bunch of weirdos. That's, that's not why you're here. Let me tell you how I used to start my trainings. We would start with our why story, and we're going to go through how to build these why stories here in a little bit, but I'll tell you mine. I have a son named Silas. He's about five years old. He's about this tall. He's got curly brown hair, blue eyes that would look big on a cow. And for some reason, he has decided that he needs to dig a hole in my front yard. I have no idea why. I just know that he's got my shovel and that this hole is consuming his life. He had a friend of, he, he filled the hole with water and then had a friend of his sit in the hole and then was writing stuff down like he's taking water displacement measurements or something. I have no idea what the kid's doing. But he's constantly digging in this hole. Now I want you to imagine for a second that there's my son Silas. And he's digging away in this hole. And into the yard comes his dog. Now you know the type of dog I'm thinking about. You've seen this dog in your neighborhood. You know this dog is mean. You know this dog is up to no good. And you can see that this dog has his eye on my son. And my son's got no idea he's there. So in this situation, Silas is here and the dog is here. Where do you find me? Where do I go? In between. No hesitation. Step right in between my son and the clear and obvious threat. And I would wager that most everyone in this room would go to that same gap, would stand in that same gap between my child and a clear and present danger. And what I ask you is this. What's the difference between Silas and that dog and Silas and socialism? It's still a clear and present danger, isn't it? In fact, it may be a greater danger than a dog because socialism is going to kill a lot more kids this year than dog attacks will. And that's why it's important that everyone who is here get as much out of this program as we can so that when we step into that breach, we have the skills that we need to defeat a clear and present danger that threatens all of our kids. Because the biggest fear I have as a parent is hearing my children cry for food and me not be able to give it to them. And the one thing that socialism consistently delivers is famine is hunger, and I will not rest so that my child goes hungry. That is my why. That is why I get up at five in the morning, get myself ready, take a little extra time on my hair for you people, <laughs> so that we can get in that breach. People don't care what I do. 
<clears throat> what do you do, Dwayne? I travel across the country and I talk to people about freedom, liberty. Why do you do that? Well, that's a whole different story, isn't it? Let me tell you why. Because I've seen the pictures. I've seen what, what collectivism does. I know what it does. I know who it hurts. That's why. That's why I do it. And it is key that you understand that why because people don't care what you do. They care why you do it. Can you advance to the next slide, the golden circle? It's on number seven, slide seven. Take some time and draw this out. People don't care what you do. They care why you do it. Understand why you're here. And guess what? It's not going to be the first why. There's something in, in Six Sigma. It's a, it's a root cause analysis. They, they call it the five whys. And it works for finding your own why. Why are you here? Well, I want to learn more about liberty. Why is that important? And you ask that question five times. Why is that important? Why is that important? Why is that important? Why is that important? By the time you get to the fifth one, now you're getting to the meat. Now you understand why you're here. Identify that why. Now, when I told my story, I used something called the personal narrative. This is something created by a man named Marshall Gans, who teaches at Harvard. And it was used by a certain state senator from Illinois in 2004 when he spoke at the Democratic National Convention. Using the personal narrative model, Barack Obama was able to elevate himself from a state senator to national attention to the White House. It is a powerful, powerful model. Let's go ahead and advance to slide, where are we at? 11. So you have three parts of the personal narrative. You have the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. So if you look back at my story, the story of self was, let me tell you about Silas. Let me tell you about the hole. Let me tell you about the dog. That's all my story. That's the story of self. Let's go ahead and, and advance to uh, challenge choice outcome, I believe it is. Slide 13. Now, each story has really three parts. There's a challenge, there's a choice, and there's an outcome. The challenge was, Silas is in the yard, there's a dog present. That's my challenge. What's my choice? My choice is I could ignore that, let Silas get mauled, or I can act and get in the way, from, way of that, take action. What's the outcome? The outcome is, meh, maybe I get bit, maybe I lose a hand, I don't know what happens. Silas gets away, that's the important part. My son doesn't get hurt. This is used, this formula is used in so many ways. A lot of the stories that we've heard over time are just so formulaic once you look at them. I'll tell you a story about a young boy whose parents are dead and he lives with his uncle and his aunt. And he's not really happy with the situation, but while he's living with his aunt, this mysterious person shows up and tells him that, that something's going on and he needs to take him away from his aunt and his uncle. And so he goes off and he learns to do all these incredible things. And he ends up battling one of the most powerful people in the entire world that he's in. And he beats him. Now, did I just describe Harry Potter or Star Wars? Both. Both. It was a challenge choice outcome. Luke had a challenge. He could stay on that planet or he could go with Ben. And what was his choice? His choice was to, to join a radical fringe religious organization and carry out one of the most horrific acts of terrorism against the galactic empire in history. But that's it. Challenge, choice, outcome. So think about what your, what your story is. What's your story of self? What's your challenge? What is it you're worried about? My challenge is I see this oncoming threat of collectivism. My choice is to do something about it. And hopefully the outcome is a reversal away from there because I've got people like you out there, part of the army, fighting this. That's, I hope that's the outcome. But I can't just up, sit up here and tell you stories about myself. I've got to go and bring you along with me. And that's where us comes in, your story of us. Now, if you remember when I told my story, 
I brought you along for it. I bet each and every person in this room would step in that same gap. Yep, I would. It's real easy to say in here when you got your suits on. Get you out in my front yard, you trip over that hole, and now the dog's on top of you. It's a different story. But I brought you in right there. And I used a little technique uh, called consistency. There's a great book called Influence by a man named Robert Cialdini. And we, he found in his studies that people like to be consistent. So if they say they do something or they say they believe something, and then you give them an opportunity to prove it, more often than not, they'll prove it. They'll want to be consistent. They'll want to do that. So when I say, we need you in that breach, you're like, yeah, I will be there. I said already that I would get in that gap. I will get in that gap. And then the final step is the story of now. Why do we need to do it right now? Well, is there any question on why we need to do it right now? We absolutely have to do it right now. If not now, when? We've already gone too far. So this is your, your basic story model. Your story of self, your story of us, your story of now. And it doesn't have to be in that order. It could be the story of us, and then the story of self, and then the story of now. Put it in whatever order works best for you. But include your why. You have to know your why. You have to include it in your story. And if you can do this, and you know when to do it, that's a game changer, my friends, because... How many, times have you, how many times have we had these conversations where you start spitting out facts and you can just kind of see the eyes glaze over? Because people buy with emotion and they justify with logic. People buy with emotion and they justify with logic. Start with that story, back it up with facts. But you've got to get them engaged. And you do that through the, through the story, through emotions. Now I want to, to how are we doing on time, folks? 39, I got a few more minutes. I want to go ahead and go to slide 16. Now, this, this video is a man named Daniel Garza. He's, is he president of Libre? President of Libre, which is one of our sister organizations. And this is his personal story. This is why he is a part of the liberty movement. This is why he gets up and, and talks to folks and does things. And listen for those three parts. The story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. If you could go ahead and play that. My name is Daniel Garza, and my American experience started off here. I grew up picking crops with my family. My parents were immigrants from Mexico with nothing but a fourth grade education. We were so poor. My siblings and I would often miss school to work in the fields. Our home was the size of a tool shed. We had no running water. And what we would do is warm buckets of water on the stove so that when my parents returned from work in the fields, uh, they would bathe uh, with small cups. My father never took welfare because he didn't want to depend on anyone or lose his dignity. He is a proud and noble man. We can make it with just three things. It's God, good credit, and freedom, liberty to work. And that's what the United States is. You know, I didn't know it at the time, but my father began saving money and buying and selling small properties. He bought a motel with the profit he made. My family and I spent long hours fixing up that motel while still working the fields. My father continued to buy and sell property, and one day he and my mother retired with enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. If I don't come to the United States, I don't think I have the life that we got right now, living so good, you know. My parents' American dream had become a reality. My family and I have succeeded by following the path to freedom, but that path is on the verge of vanishing. What we're starting to see here in America now is a growth in the size and the scope of government that is now starting to look like the governments that we left behind. I'm just torn apart when I see folks who are caught in this um, dependency that government offers. And not only that, they've condemned their children to a life of mediocrity and subsistence. That this is not the American dream. 
This is an American nightmare. The Libre Initiative is reaching the Hispanic community before they are lost forever. We know advancing economic freedom is the best way to improve human well-being, especially those at the bottom. And that's our message to the world. You know, one day I was speaking before a group of 150 evangelical Hispanic ministers in South Texas, and a man stood up. He had tears in his eyes and said, you know, I've never heard these things before. Why has nobody told us? Most Hispanics have never even heard about economic freedom, but they know it. Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, Hispanics leave countries that have been ruined by tyranny to come to America, the land of the free. They don't just believe in the cause, they've lived it. It is a privilege to live in the United States because this is a nation where you dictate your destiny. No other nation has fulfilled more dreams and more aspirations than this country. And to have been born here, uh, I'm just grateful to God for that. Learn how you can get involved at joinlibre.org. I've probably seen that video a hundred times and it uh, still gives me goosebumps. I'd show you, I pulled my, I don't want anybody fainting because I work out a lot. <laughs> but uh, what did he start with? He started with the story of self, didn't he? Let me tell you about my, 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 the way I grew up. Let me tell you about my family. Let me tell you about how hard working my parents are. And then he went to what? There's a very specific break in there. And I, it, every time I hear it, it I, I think I've got to remember that line. And what he says is, what's happening in America now? And that's clearly story of now. So he went from story of self to story of now. What's happening in America now is a tragedy. And then he described what's happening in America now. And then he went to the Libre Initiative. Join us. Join us in what we're doing. Story of us. It's a very clear story of self, story of now, story of us. I'm going to, I, I looked while that was going on and I thought, I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to throw in a little bonus for you because we have time and I love you all. So there's something called the human action model, and this comes from an economist named uh, Ludwig von Mises. Anybody heard of him? I'm a fan. Yeah, Mises. So what he talks about is people take action for three reasons. First, you've got to, and you can write these down, I don't have slides for them, I'm happy to go over them again. The first thing you need to get someone to take action is a vision of a better state. You need a vision of a better state. I'm sorry. I, I, I skipped part two. The first thing you need to do is create a sense of unease. I apologize. The step one is create a sense of unease. Now let me clarify what that means. People do things for one of two reasons. We're all here for one of two reasons. We're either here to avoid pain or we're here to gain pleasure. This goes all the way back to Aristotle taught this. We are here to avoid pain or gain pleasure. Some of you may be here because there are friends of yours here and you're looking forward to seeing them over the next couple days. Some of you may be here because you get joy out of seeing Jesse Waters. You're, you're here because you gain pleasure. Some of you may be here because you have a honeydew list and you'd rather be here than mowing the lawn. You're avoiding that pain. But that's what it comes down to. So when you create a sense of unease, you can do that in four different ways. You can explain to someone, things are good right now, but they could be better. And that taps into that gaining pleasure. You could say things are good right now, but they could be a lot worse. That's avoiding that pain. You could say things are bad right now, but they could be a lot better. Gain pleasure. Things are bad right now, but they could be a lot worse. Avoid pain. So first thing you do is create that sense of unease. Then you give them a vision of a better state. It doesn't have to be like this. It could be like that. And if you stop there, you've wasted your breath because step three is the key. You've got to give them a realistic path to get there. If you don't have a realistic path to achieve that vision of a better state, they're not going to take action. They're simply not going to take action. I could sit up here and describe a free market libertarian utopia and you say, that sounds awesome. How are we going to do that? Like, I don't know, man. That's... Whew. It'd be awesome though, wouldn't it? That'd be great. And 
To what end? I've wasted your time, I've wasted my breath. You have to have that vision of a better state and a realistic path to get there. One of the most fantastic examples of this was in 1980, yeah, 1980, no, 84, I'm sorry, 1984. It's morning in America. Anybody remember that commercial? It's morning in America. Let me tell you how things are awesome in this country right now. The birds are chirping, people are buying homes, you got food in your refrigerator, it's morning in America. Now, are you better off than you were four years ago? Hmm, yeah, yeah. Well, do you wanna go back to the policies that there were before? No, I don't. Then vote for President Reagan. Sense of unease. Things are good, but if you go back to the policies of four years ago, that's bad. Vision of a better state, we can keep moving forward. How are we gonna do that? Vote for this dude. Doesn't, you don't even have to go back that far. Every ad that you hear on television or radio follows this model. How are you going to save 15% or more on car insurance? <laughs> Geico, right? I get, they do not sponsor this training, I just use that. But you're paying too much for car insurance. I am, what? I am now in a state of unease. Well, let me tell you, uh, you could say 15% or less. How can I do that? Here's your vision. Here's your realistic path to get there. Go to geico.com. Every advertisement follows the human action model. So if you can use, and I'm supposed to be done by 5 tell so they can set up for the next one. And I told them, uh, nobody ever complains about a short sermon, so I'll probably be done a little early. I want to wrap up. And I want to reinforce, Ashley and her team are outside. This training that you just went through is one of many trainings that we offer. And we would love to come back and work with you all, teach you all how to really start making an impact in your communities. Because we've got, we're the ones standing in that breach. We are the ones standing in that breach. And if we do not have the skills and knowledge that we need to push back, we'll get overrun. Training, you can see on my computer, it says training matters. Training does matter. Learn how to do these things, because I can tell you right now, the other side is. The other side is. They are out there training every day. And uh, <laughs> I don't remember, uh, somebody told me, they were like, you should take a vacation. And I just, I was half joking, but half serious. I said, socialism and take a break. Socialism taking a vacation? I'm not taking a vacation. And my wife said, no, we're going on vacation. I was like, <laughs> okay, so. But they're right outside. I would really like you to, uh, to take some time and go talk with them, get to know them, work with them, and see if we can't come back and put something together and really, uh, really start making a difference in this country, this state, this county, this city. And uh, I was serious when I said earlier, I love you all. Thank you. You are my kind of people here at 9 a.m. It's for you. Good job. Thank you all.